All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, today, we've got some exciting business in front of us today. We're going to be looking off there. Thanks for the confirmation. Uh, we're going to be working through the rest of STARS a little bit. Some might tail into Wednesday. And so I thought we'd want to get going with some various uh, logistical details. So I have good news and bad news. The good news is you're here in class today. The bad news is we have a midterm coming up. Uh, so, yeah, uh, in about two weeks' time, or I guess six classes, uh, including today, Friday, February 4th, in the class, we'll have our first midterm in this class. Uh, the cutoff for material for that class is going to be this Friday's material, and given my current pacing, I think that'll include chapters one and two in the textbook, uh, the Gaia article, sections one through six, and maybe a little bit of chapter three. The keen-eyed observers will notice that chapter three isn't posted yet. I am frantically uh, trying to get at least the chunk of it that will be on the midterm finished. So I hope that's ready by class on Wednesday. Uh, it would just be a little bit of uh, material brought together. So the format based on our discussion is that, it, or your votes last time, is that it should be open book. This means that there should be no interaction with other people allowed. This should go without saying, but you're surprised at the things that somehow need to be said anyways. Uh, the format is there'll be 15 multiple choice questions sequential. I think it has to be sequential because we are doing this open book, so that means that everybody kind of has to have different multiple choice questions at different times so that you, know, you can avoid the obvious failure mode of just having them all available and working through them and you know messaging each other. I'm under no illusion that uh, this is a secure testing format given the way we've set this up. Uh, but I want to give you, like, uh, I'll talk a bit about the midterm's purpose in a bit. And then uh, with will be two free response questions uh, that will be done through the assigned to format. So you'll basically work them on your own paper, scan them, and then upload a picture uh, there. They'll include problems and possibly a few sentences of explanation there. Uh, I'm not gonna use SEM or, or SEM or whatever. This is just gonna be straight up Zoom only proctoring. And that means you do need a functioning camera and microphone. I have a dog that's licking me under the table. Don't worry about it. Uh, so the, uh, you need a functioning camera and microphone. I haven't decided that, uh, whether we'll be, uh, doing anything like weird, like leaving the mics open, which would probably be annoying in a lot of ways, but would allow me to recognize when you're getting text messages. I don't know. I'm still working out exactly how it'll work, but it's going to be zoom, uh, open up. Uh, yeah. Come on. Come on, puppy. Let's go. Let's go. Say hi, puppy. Come on. Can you see? Nope. Hop, hop. Up, up. Yeah. Say hi. Say hi. Say hi. There we go. That's a good puppy. That's a good puppy. Okay. Anyways, this adorable dog brought to you to mitigate the blow that you are getting a midterm soon. Uh, if you miss the final or you do poorly on it, the weight on it automatically transfers to the final based on the ace clause. So... Uh, the purpose of the midterm is that this is supposed to be kind of a low stakes, am I getting it? Like nothing, like, uh, you know, the, the testing environment is really just making sure that you're caught up on this. It's supposed to just be sort of more formative feedback for you. I feel like I need to put in some structure here to like keep it uh, a little bit more in sense of academic integrity. Uh, so that's why we have some of these more annoying uh, prescriptions put in place. But the goal here is for you to sort of get a sense of what I think is important coming into the final final exam. All right. So, uh, anybody got some questions? Throw them in your lecture question slots. Here we are. Uh, uh, questions. Will the ones from Gaia be like the one E-class exercise we did? Yeah. So the point here is that uh, what you'll be seeing uh, on the midterm is stuff that you've done in class. And there'll be sometimes a little synthesis where there'll be like two things that you have in class coming together here. One of my big things that I really like for this kind of class is I give you a figure and I ask you to interpret it. Uh, we have so many graphs that come at you in this class. And so a lot of the questions are going to be, what does this mean? Uh, from the figures. You'll get more of that later, uh, but here I think the important thing is to kind of understand the figures that we have presented in the book so far. Other questions?
I'm just excited about questions. Questions might happen. Nothing focuses the mind like, oh, there's a midterm coming up. Uh, yeah, sorry. Two free response questions are just that you'll get a, you'll, so you'll work through the multiple choice questions, you'll be done, and then you'll go, that will, uh, when you say, okay, so it's going to work, it's an E-class quiz, you'll get a questionnaire, two at a time, you'll work through it, you say, okay, I'm done, and you should spend about half and half time, you hit done, and that'll open up the next section of the midterm on E-class, and you'll be able to just go in, and it'll give you two questions, and you just write them out on your paper, uh, and then upload, you know, scan it and upload and all that. I'm sort of shooting for a 45 mid. I am shooting for a 45 minute midterm, and then I'll accept basically give you kind of five to ten minutes to scan and get everything in because nothing makes internet failures like a midterm exam, as far as I can tell. So uh, we're supposed. To, I, I, I'd like for us to be reasonably easygoing about this, um, and so I. You know, given there's the ace clause and everything, uh, I hope that this is really going to fulfill the intended purposes of just being a formative experience where you're like, do I actually get what's been going on in the class so far? Uh, and then the other thing I said about the uh, two pre-response questions is that it could involve like a few sentence explanation or a short calculation. I recognize that in a 40, you know, it's basically five to 10 minutes. Uh, that's basically going to be like one of the harder e-poll questions at the hardest, maybe combining two easy e-poll questions. So that's the kind of stuff. I'll give you some more details on like a study guide uh, as we get closer to it. But I just want to give this because it's coming up soon. Uh, we have our homework. There is no homework assigned for that Friday because there's a midterm that Friday. So there's uh, homework for will happen the following. It will come out this weekend and be due the week after the midterm. Okay, I'm moving on. Uh, so last time we talked about uh, spe stellar spectral classes. And we went over OBAF GKM, and I tacked on LTY because this is actual stuff here in the galaxy uh, where we have to pay attention to brown dwarfs. Uh, and so I want to put those in. And I just want to note that the spectral classes are from the lines in the stellar spectra. So all this business that you see right here is uh, shown like these spectral lines here in the spectra are what we pay attention to. And you'll notice that this line, whatever it is, it's hydrogen. But whatever it is, is strong in these, and then in these later types, uh, GKM, it uh, largely vanishes. And so this is because it was easy to measure lines in stellar spectra without getting these beautifully calibrated flux uh, curves. Back in the like 1910s and 1920s when we were doing this classification, it's easy just to say this line is strong or weak versus I've calibrated this to 13.3 Janskys across the entire band. That, that required much better detector technologies. Um, I totally wanted to say something else. It's gone. Chick, chick, chick. Brain like an Etch-a-Sketch today. Uh, oh, right, I remember. Uh, earlier, uh, I will occasionally say earlier versus later types. This is crazy because you will discover in this class we have two things. We have early and late type galaxies and early and late type stars. And to make things even worse, late type stars are found in early type galaxies predominantly and so on. It's it's a horrible convention. But when I say that, we, the early types are the uh, one side of the spectrum. So this is just shorthand. It's just language. There's no physics to it. But generally, these are the early side and these are called the late side. Uh, so that's going to be you know, it's going to be something I will occasionally say. I just want to unpack the language here. I'll try very hard to uh, be clear about it. That's old. The new stuff is that we are, I don't think we had talked about luminosity classes. And the luminosity classes of uh, stars are also visible in their stellar lines. And they are given Roman numerals uh, here. That's one, two, three, four, five, and six. And they fall into this category of supergiants, giants, subgiants, dwarfs, and subdwarfs, where main sequence stars are dwarfs. I just know that this is main sequence stars. Uh, and we tell the difference between 
uh, luminosity classes actually based on the width of their lines. These are two stars of the same spectral type, uh, but the A01, that's Roman numeral one, not I, uh, is going to be a have narrower spectral lines than the A05 uh, star. And that luminosity class comes from the surface gravity of the star. So the class one star, or the luminosity class one stars, have weaker surface gravities because they're big. And that puts more of their, their large radius and they have not that much more mass. And so what happens is that pulls down their surface gravity, which is gm over r squared uh, for the star. And what that means is that all of the molecules and or atoms really that are forming these spectral lines here are not under as much pressure. And if they're under not as much pressure, that turns out to lead to narrower spectral lines. Under high pressure, those spectral lines end up broadening out because the, the atoms and molecules that are forming lines keep getting hit uh, really frequently in a high pressure environment and that ends up shortening their uh, sort of radiative state lifetimes in a way that ends up broadening the spectral lines. It's buried in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle so the width, the energy width, corresponds to uh, becoming larger as the collision time shortens the state. So that's the physics behind what actually happens in pressure broadening. For our class, we only need to know that higher pressure means that the lines are wider. So they saw these narrower lines, and that's secretly telling you about the surface gravities of the stars, and in turn that's telling you about the sizes of them. They didn't really know this at the time, but they sort of did the classification anyways and ended up with this nomenclature, bringing us to how we divide up the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in terms of these luminosity classes. And so these have been broken up. There's actually extras that have been thrown in here. Uh, but uh, the general sense of it is that these lead to sort of strips in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. You don't really need to know exactly what this is and like how to break things up in the classification. Irrelevant for what we're doing, it's just if you go ahead and look at something and you read an article and it says this is a B9V star or B95, you know that that's a main sequence star of spectral type B, which is pretty hot, but almost an A star because it's B9. So it just, you need to be able to unpack that and understand what it means in order to read the literature. So I'm giving you language and convention, not a lot of physics right now. I mean, it's been the story of this so far. So this gives us all the pieces we need to start to unpack the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is laid out here. Uh, we've seen this diagram plenty. This is the Gaia Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. We know exactly where this comes from. We've studied the research behind it. We understand why we have to cull out extinction or get low extinction stars to get this nice clean relation. And these are the local stars, the ones around us here in the galaxy near the sun. And all we're seeing is uh, this diagram. So this is is a classic tool we've sort of exposed it a few times before and this allows us to pull together the different pieces of stellar evolution and relate them to observations so that's what's amazing about the HR diagram like you see it all the time in stellar astrophysics and astro in general if you've taken the 100 122 we talk about it there maybe even in 101 I don't even know but the it's all the pieces are here and the reason why the HR diagram is interesting is that it has structures in it. If you look at the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, there's nothing here. There's very little stuff here. There's some stuff here. What's this V thing going on here? The Hertzsprung Russell diagram actually is telling us about the interiors of stars. We can look at the different parts of the HR diagram classify the stars together. And what's neat about stellar evolution is that they share physical properties. Those are the same physical pro like the same physical interior conditions of stars, which is why this is so useful and it's been a big piece of it. So if we look at this diagram, we're now able to kind of pull apart all the pieces in terms of all the labels in the axes. So just for reference, 
from the material in chapter one, we now know what all of these axes mean and we can interpret those. Here, we've been talking about the luminosity and the temperature a bit from the physics and the stuff in Boltzmann law. And now we also understand where these letters come from, O, B, A, F, G, K, M across the top, and then L, T is sort of over here. Then we can go ahead and classify the different parts of the hertzsprung russell diagram with the physical conditions of the stars that are in there. And these are the kind of classic pieces that we'll use. We have the white dwarfs down in this corner, the main sequence running along here. This little elbow right here is where the subgiants are found. That's that class four in the luminosity classes. There's this red giant branch. There's this thing that's called the red clump. Uh, those are helium burning stars. And then the AGB stars sort of form the top of this arc here. You'll dive into this giant sequence in more detail as you read the Gaia article for Friday. It picks it apart in more detail. But this is, allows us to pick apart this HR diagram and understand the physics of what's actually inside it. So it's really cool. So what we want to do next is start to talk about the HR diagram, but I've been yammering on for a solid 16 minutes, so I thought it'd be good to sort of do a stop and check yourself to sort of interpret this. What we want to do is ask, how big are these stars? Express your answer in solar radii. So I'll start up the e-poll and then give you a couple pieces here. The first thing that you should note is that since you are on this HR diagram and it's helpfully provided you with a temperature, and a luminosity, you can use the Stefan Boltzmann law. So you know that L is equal to four pi R squared sigma SB T to the fourth. And since we haven't had our constants quiz, I will provide you that L sun is equal to 3.83 times 10 to the 26 watts. The radius of the sun is equal to 6.96 times 10 to the eighth meters. And then sigma SB is equal to 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. So that should give you all the pieces you need to unpack this problem. So go nuts. I'm going to shut up for a bit. Uh, if you have any questions, hit them up in the lecture uh, questions chat on the Discord or into the Zoom. Yeah, R squared, you're right.
I'm just sort of working along here. I think people have sort of come along. Yeah, most people got their answers in. So uh, 10 to the 4. So, so I just read off the values here. Uh, 10,000 total luminosities, 3,000 Kelvin. Uh, we plug that into our formula, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. Uh-oh, running out of space. Times, whoop, and then 3,000 Kelvin to the fourth. And then this whole thing is square rooted. Man, I have definitely written neater things in my life, uh, believe it or not. And so when I grind that all out, I get 2.57 times 10 to the 11 meters times uh, one solar radii is equal to 6.96 times 10 to the 8 meters. And then I get an answer of 370 solar radii. When it's all said and done, what do we see over here? Uh, doo -doo -doo. I see yeah, a lot of 370s. I love it. 369, I'll let it through, we're good. Okay, any questions on how that played out? All right, I'm seeing no typing indicator, so we're gonna roll on. Okay, uh, so you'll notice that that's huge. 370 times the size of our sun and is pretty substantial. And what we see is that in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, we've already established that things that are on the right side are colder and on the left side are hotter. That's just labeled here, built into the color indices. The definitions of absolute magnitudes are giving us the vertical axis as it's more luminous. And this relationship in the Stefan-Boltzmann law for a thermal-like emitter means that the stuff, uh, as we move up into the upper right-hand corner, is larger. So these are where the giants tend to be found. Uh, they're really referring to their size in terms of uh, radius. So these are truly giant stars. They have large radius here. So that's just what we ground through. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is actually physically what's going to go on in the stars. I'm going to whip through this really quickly. There's some de a little more detail in the book, uh, but really this is the stuff in Astro 320. Where, again, we're just sort of setting up the scaffolding we need to move on. We are almost done with all our preliminary material and we can launch full scale into the uh, you know properties of galaxies based on these pieces. So... The process of stellar evolution moves stars around in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So you gotta remember when I say moves around, that means that its physical properties are changing. We'll talk about it moving through the galaxy later, but not actually captured in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So moving here means a change in luminosity, temperature, radius, and those are all linked by this kind of thermal emission through the Stefan-Boltzmann law. The first step in stellar evolution is the formation of a star, and we call that pre-main sequence evolution. Pre-main sequence evolution means that the gas cloud ends up contracting down and forming a star. It's been you know, covered in Astro 320 in detail. We'll go into a little bit about this in the context of the initial mass function uh, starting probably on Wednesday. Uh, yeah, I'm talking slow next week. Uh, and so the gas cloud uh, contracts down to form stars and it moves from larger radii down and it does this little dog leg here because of the nature of opacity in the atmosphere of the star and comes out here for a and lands on what's called the zero age main sequence. I should note, I forgot to put this in the slide, that these are all tracks for a solar metallicity star at one solar mass. So this is our sun. So we're uh, basically seeing the evolution of it. And it lands here on the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and moves on into uh, the uh, ignition on the main sequence. This brings us to the zero age main sequence. A star is considered a star once it starts fusing hydrogen into helium in the core of the star. That's a star. If it doesn't do that, 
it ends up as a brown dwarf, also known as not a star. So this uh, this uh, barrier is, do I start fusion in the core? And that's how we describe what a star is. Is it something that has done that hydrogen to helium fusion in its core at some point in its life? So that's the ignition of the star, and it comes out here and ends up on the zero age main sequence. The clever observer will note that I can walk along here and march over and see, you know, that's not one solar luminosity. One solar luminosity is this point right here. That's 10 to the zero, that's one. But it starts out here on this little star and that's not zero or 10 to the zero. It's more like 0.7. So our sun starts its life 30% less luminous than it is right now. And it undergoes an evolution on the, uh, on the main sequence over the 10 billion years of its lifetime. It ends up just moving up, it gets a little hotter and then it moves around and cools off a little bit, and it will end up giving, uh, ending its life at close to two solar luminosities. So it's really, you know, the sun is getting brighter over the course of its life. Uh, they say it's kind of giggier scale uh, problems. You know, if we can make it through the next, you know, 100 years, then maybe we'll worry about the sun getting too hot. But uh, for now, what you can also see is that uh, our, our effective temperature is creeping up, and we're about as hot as the sun is going to get here at about 5,777 Kelvin as its effective temperature. Why is it getting brighter and hotter, or bright, basically brighter on the main sequence? That's a consequence of nuclear fusion in the core. When I take nuclear fusion in the core, what I'm doing is essentially I'm turning four hydrogen uh, nuclei into one helium nucleus. And to preserve charge balance, I end up taking you know, each of those four protons that are running around in the core of the star has four electrons also running around in the core of the star. And through the process of nuclear fusion, you end up taking those four hydrogen particles and turning them into one helium nucleus. And you end up taking two, four of those electrons and you end up turning, coupling out two positrons, which annihilate, leaving behind two electrons. So what happens is I've gone from basically eight particles, this is 10, this is eight, eight particles down to three. Yeah, no, something like that. There's three, I can, I, I totally can mute. And what this means is that I'm removing pressure support from the core of the star. And that's why I'm sort of illustrating here, is that when you take away particles, all particles in a gas contribute equally to pressure support. They're thermalized, so the electrons and the positrons are in, uh, electrons and the protons are as important for pressure support uh, as each other. The mass of a proton is much larger, so the protons contribute a lot more to gravity. And so what happens is I'm reducing the number or density of particles in the star. This means that I'm basically taking away pressure support. There's fewer particles, there's less pressure support. And the, uh, the pressure support causes the star to contract. And as a star contracts, we can go back to the stuff earlier and, uh, in, the, um, in this chapter. If it contracts, all else being equal, it ends up heating up. So the temperature also ends up rising. Uh, so the contracts, the interior temperature rises up. And if I turn up the temperature, that ends up driving the rate of nuclear fusion faster. And that raises the luminosity of the star. So we get this heating up because we're losing particles out of the center of the sun. The sun ends up compensating for that by turning up the rate of its nuclear energy generation. And that ends up putting out more solar luminosity. So we get this process. And that explains this little hook right here. And that brings us up to what's called the TAMS, the terminal age main sequence. And at that point, the sun has turned all of its hydrogen into helium in the core. And you have this big chunk of material, sort of 0.13 solar masses of just straight helium in the center of the core. And then uh, we get a little cutaway like this. I'm going to show you these cutaways as we go. And we have I've sort of color coded everything with different uh, forms. And so we end up on the main sequence with uh, fusion burning or hydrogen fusion in the core. And then we have an inert outer layer that we call the envelope of the star. After the terminal age main sequence, the core contracts and ultimately gets supported by degenerate pre degeneracy pressure. And then it ignites a layer of hydrogen fusion around the, uh, 
uh, it, uh, around the core, uh, which is degenerate, and it starts climbing up this uh, red giant branch. And when it ends up sort of climbing up the red giant branch, because as the hydrogen fuses into helium, it dumps more helium into the degenerate core, which ends up contracting the core because degenerate pressure is weird. And that cranks up the luminosity in the shell burning source. And it sort of moves up here, it becomes larger. Surface temperature gets colder uh, and the uh, luminosity climbs up. Question? or just a spontaneous unmute. Okay. Uh, all right, so as we climb up the um, red giant branch, we eventually reach the point that's called the TRGB, which is the tip of the red giant branch. And what happens here is that the core has basically built up into uh, it, the core has basically built up mass until it reaches a, a high temperature, about 100 million Kelvin. And at that point, it will ignite helium fusion. And helium fusion is peculiar because you'd think that two heliums would slap together and form a beryllium, but that's an exotherm, it's uh, endothermic. You need energy to make beryllium out of helium. So what you have to do is you end up forming uh, straight to carbon. Carbon is an exothermic reaction, and so you end up bringing three helium particles together to form carbon. This is sometimes called the triple alpha process because a helium nucleus is also an alpha particle. Uh, this kicks off in the degenerate core it basically leads to something called the helium flash and that blows up the uh, core of the star it doesn't unbind the whole star but it lifts the degeneracy pressure in the star and drops it down uh, here to what's called the helium burning sequence uh, and so uh, just briefly what a red giant looks like as this big envelope huge convective envelope around uh, the star it has a degenerate helium core in the center not doing much except getting mass and then this uh, hydrogen fusion shell source is dumping material onto the uh, helium core which is getting smaller hotter and more dense and then uh, this ignites and drops down onto the helium burning sequence. I will say very briefly that this process of helium core ignition always happens when the core is about four tenths of a solar mass worth of material. And that means that when it starts to ignite, it drops down and always ends up at about the same luminosity and radius and temperature. And so these stars tend to clump up at solar luminosity, which means that they are red and they form a clump, so they call it the red clump. All right, I'm gonna pause there and see if anybody wants to shout out or type in any questions because we're kind of halfway through a star's life. All right, silence. Okay, uh, on the horizontal branch or the helium burning sequence, the HB serves for both of them. Uh, these are where the star is undergoing uh, helium to carbon fusion in its core. And so it ends up with a structure that looks a little like this. Uh, we have helium uh, fusion we, uh, or helium core burning. We have an inert helium core uh, envelope around that. You have a shell hydrogen source and you start to build up this like candy coated model for the interior of the star. Uh, for our purposes, what we really need to know is that stars in that red clump are doing helium fusion. The exact structure isn't important. And then outside of that, we have this unprocessed hydrogen envelope. Well, Eventually, the star runs out of helium to fuse. We uh, basically turn it all into metals uh, here in the core. And in that process, that starts to contract uh, down, becomes degenerate, starts to uh, fuse, and uh, starts, uh, sorry, becomes degenerate, contracts, and then it ignites a helium burning shell source around the degenerate core. And you start creeping up this red giant branch uh, sort of direction, uh, except we, uh, since the red giant branch is degenerate helium core hydrogen shell source, 
We call this the asymptotic giant branch, very close to the red giant branch, asymptotically close, one might even say, except it is has a degenerate carbon, carbon oxygen core, because it's pretty easy to fuse carbon to oxygen just by adding another helium. Uh, then you have hydrogen and helium happening in shell fusion sources around this degenerate core, and it's undergoing the same process as happened on the red giant branch, dumping material down to lower shell, uh, uh, lower interior shells. They're getting smaller, the shell source is heating up, the envelope is getting bigger, and the surface temperature is dropping, and critically, the luminosity is creeping up, so it moves up on this stage. Uh, this, sta this fusion is a little unstable, and so it starts to, uh, as you get up towards the top level, it starts happening in uh, cycles where the star will kind of contract a little bit, the fusion will jump up, it'll blow off layers of the star, and it will undergo what's called thermal pulsation. So this is often called the TPAGB. Uh, so thermal pulsation, asymptotic giant branch. This is the last stage of the star, kind of as a star, and it throws off its uh, outer layers at this point and has a structure that looks like this, where you have a degenerate carbon, oxygen, maybe even some neon in there, uh, core. You have a helium shell source. You have inert helium layer. You have a hydrogen shell source, and then an inert hydrogen layer. And in the thermal pulsation stage, material is getting ejected here. Some of it is enriched with the products of hydrogen and helium fusion. Uh, so it gets put out with these enriched uh, metals and then ends up throwing off its outer layers and moving over, leaving behind the fusion uh, source, basically the engine, as this degenerate carbon oxygen core. And that's what ultimately becomes a white dwarf. And so those stars get left behind as the sort of byproducts of the fusion in a star. And it ends up following this cooling sequence and basically hooks around and ends up down here on the white dwarf uh, sequence. I didn't show that just for brevity here. Uh, the process of them throwing off their outer layers gives us these gorgeous images of planetary nebula. Planet has nothing to do with planets. They just were listed as planetary nebula, so as not to be confused with things like, you know, Neptune in the outer solar system uh, when you're sort of scanning around with a telescope. And so you look at these beautiful uh, sort of layers getting thrown off. They're, they're just gorgeous. And then you have right in the center, you have the uh, cooling off cores of the star leaving behind these white dwarfs. So that's where baby white dwarfs come from. Uh, and yeah, so they're left behind. It's basically the left behind uh, remnants. So that's a short, short summary of stellar evolution. I can do that in four lectures in Astro 320. So uh, very briefly, uh, where is a star the largest? All right, we're coming to the end. Get your answers in. Awesome. All right. Yes. Okay, so uh, correct answer here is the thermal pulsation AGB. And you can get that just by looking at this luminosity temperature diagram and recalling that as we move up into the upper right-hand corner, these are large radius stars small r. And these stars up here are the things that are in farthest up into that corner. And then you just read down here. Oh, that's the TPAGB uh, plot symbol indicator. Okay. Uh, any questions on that or the quick, quick version of stellar evolution?
Yeah, so I only present that. It's a nice story. It's very quick. Uh, but the reason why we want to present that is we need to just sort of look at how different things evolve. Yes, all of these things are undergoing exciting and different physical changes inside their interiors. But what's important is the differences with stellar properties. Uh, so the first main thing that leads to differences in stellar properties is the initial mass of the star. And stars with different initial masses will follow different tracks. So what I've shown you here is the one solar mass uh, sequence here, which does this little hook and does a bounce around and comes back down and forms a white dwarf over the course of life. Remember, it's not moving around in space, changing radius, luminosities, surface temperatures. That's all we see. Uh, but we're inferring their internal conditions. Uh, higher mass stars tend to do more horizontal evolution, and that's because more, when things are moving horizontally, they are moving, uh, in, a, uh, they are moving in a non-degenerate state, so their material isn't degenerate here. And so high mass stars tend to ignite their fusion without going through degenerate states, and that ends up moving them back and forth. Every time you see these kind of little notches here, like this little hook here, is the ignition of a later stage of nuclear fusion. So uh, 10 solar mass stars, uh, this is the carbon uh, fusion there. Uh, would a star with less than one solar mass follow the one solar mass track? It follows it pretty close. Um, the thing that we don't worry about that too much in this class is that stars that are less than about 0.9 solar masses, 0.9 largely follows one solar mass, they don't evolve in the age of the universe. Within 14, their main sequence lifetimes are the basically longer than the age of the universe. So a 0.8 solar mass star for our purposes does do 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 and then sits there. Done. That's all it does, which is kind of, you know, not the most exciting thing. Uh, there are predicted behaviors for low mass evolution, which are pretty cool, but you know, since they don't show up in galaxies, we don't worry about them. Sorry, unsatisfying, but you know, we've got, we've got to beat a swath of detail through the uh, physics here. Uh, the other big thing that is super important for us here in this class is that stars actually follow different evolutionary tracks when they have different metallicities. And that's because the lower the metallicity, that means there's less opacity in the star. And so I drew this analogy about a big puffy coat around the star. The insulating layer in a low metallicity star isn't as effective as insulating. It's like wearing a thin little jacket instead of your big puffy parka. And as a result, all of the, your energy is going to uh, spill out. And so this means that a star ends up having to be a lot hotter and go through its nuclear fusion supplies faster at lower luminosities just because its energy leaks away. You have a certain amount of energy built into the nuclear fusion process. And if you're losing it faster, that means you are going to evolve faster. So lower metallicity means that these stars are going to be higher luminosities and higher surface temperatures. And so what I've shown you here is the tracks for these stars at solar metallicity in black. And then in red is at 10 to the minus 3 times solar luminosity. So these would be very early in the evolution of stars. So they end up sort of putting out a lot of their energy, and they have materially different uh, evolution. And it also leads to some ambiguity. You'll notice that the uh, main sequence kind of follows a track through like this, and it's often hard to tell just from looking at the luminosity of a star whether something is higher mass and high metallicity or lower mass and low metallicity. They all end up being more luminous. So it's something we do have to be aware of and include in our calculations. You won't have to do the calculations in detail, but we should recognize the signatures of changing metallicity. The other big factor that's important for us and maybe not touched so much in Astro 320 is mass loss. Uh, the mass loss from stars is substantial over the course of their lives. And in fact, the mass loss from high mass stars is one of the dominant things that shapes their evolution 
and galaxy evolution as a whole. So we talked about the solar wind kicking off about 10 to the minus 14 solar masses of particles per uh, year in our own solar system. In other solar systems, those numbers are like 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 5 solar masses per year. So this means that like, and those, sorry, those are high mass stars. And so that means that stars can lose a huge fraction of their mass uh, over their main sequence lifetime. And what I've plotted here is the fraction of mass lost as a function of the initial mass of the star for a couple of metallicities. So what we have here in the blue line is the mass loss for a regular solar metallicity star. And here, opacity it ends up being something that allows it to sort of trap radiation and get pushed off more effectively. And so what this means is that high metallicity high mass stars lose a lot of their mass. And you notice that this is one up here. So a 100 or 200 solar mass star can lose over 90% of its mass in the course of its life. And this changes its evolution. And it's why the main sequence lifetimes of these stars are a little bit longer than you would expect just from a naive mass luminosity scaling relationship. Right. Is the mass loss because of nuclear fusion or the solar wind? So the real answer is it's kind of indirectly because of fusion. It is the luminosity that then bubble uh, in the core, bubbles out through the envelope, and then there's so much radiation pressure at the surface of the star that that ends up pushing off the outer layers. There is just that much uh like there's that much radiation pressure that can simply accelerate the layers off of the star uh, just because there's so much light coming out. Those photons hit the material and say, hey, let's go off into space. And the material goes along with it. All right. The next thing to notice is that the low metallicity stars tend not to lose as much material. That's because the radiation doesn't couple as well to the material. It's the same reason why it leaks out really easily. And so a low metallicity star only ends up losing about 10% of its mass as opposed to 90% of its mass over the course of its life. Here, really referring to high mass stars. So this is telling us that these high, high mass stars, 100 solar mass stars, evolve in a way that their material that they throw out into space affects their evolution. And it turns out these winds that blow off into the local galaxy end up suppressing local star formation and stirring up the star forming gas in their environment through a process that we call stellar feedback. Hmm, I'm just looking at the time. I'll just say this briefly and we'll come back to the details later. Okay, so those high mass stars <coughs> end their lives through supernova explosions. And this, uh, this ends up being the end of a high mass star's life for all stars greater than about nine solar masses. And we'll come back here and I'll note that nine solar masses is around here on the mass loss regime. So you'll notice that this is at most going to change the mass of the star by 1%. So this doesn't really mean, it means that mass loss is not going to affect things that are going supernovae here uh, until we get to high, high masses. So there's um, basically two, re uh, the, the supernova occur because you can essentially fuse um, material uh, the carbon into higher uh, higher atomic number states. And this means that you can get out energy all the way up to that peak of the binding energy per nucleon curve of 56 iron, at which point there's a catastrophic collapse of this material down until it is stopped not by electron degeneracy, like a white dwarf, but by neutron degeneracy pressure, which then sort of forms this neutron star, which precipitates a supernova. The neutronization uh, is key to uh, precipitating a supernova explosion. From there, it can go on to form a black hole, uh, but this neutron star is an essential part of creating a supernova explosion. Now, supernova are a poorly defined term because all this means, and I stress this in the book, is that there is an injection of about 10 to the 44 
joules of energy. And we care about these events because they're relatively common and they dump out a bunch of energy into galaxies. And so what I just called a supernova is called a core collapse supernova. And we'll also learn that there are these things called supernova explode, uh, thermonuclear supernova. And they happen when two white dwarfs collide with each other. Uh, they were in a binary system and they end up colliding with each other, igniting runaway fusion of carbon oxygen and neon into iron peak elements, iron and uh, nickel and stuff right up there at the peak of the mining energy per nuclear curve. They're only called the same thing because they have the same energy scale. Two different channels, both relate to stellar evolution, but they're only called that because they're common and 10 to the 44 joules of energy. So that's the only reason that these are the same. They are physically different things. All right, that's a wrap for today. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have questions. Other than that, uh, thanks for your patience, and I will see you Wednesday.